Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. How are how are you? Awesome, awesome, looking great. Keeping warm. Keeping warm. That's good. Yep. I'm gonna do a reflection today on the six sources of Unitarianism, and um, you see how all this kind of comes together in a beautiful way under the umbrella of Unitarian Universalism. We have a wide range of sources and inspirations for who we are and for our spirituality, for our social justice commitments in the world. But um, I'm just checking in. This past week uh, was an interesting week in Lake Wobegon. Um, <laughs> in, in Charleston, we went down to see the, uh, the grandchildren. You know, that's our big magnet to Charleston, by the way, if you haven't discovered that. The granddaughters, Lucy and Violet, identical twin granddaughters, turned nine years old. And they are nothing short of a miracle because they were Momo twins. Now, I don't know the big long word for Momo, whatever it was, but basically that means that after the egg was fertilized, it split. And so both uh, girls shared the same placenta. And the danger in that is that one of them could have been strangled by the umbilical cord. So the last two months of my daughter's pregnancy, she had to be in the hospital, monitored, just to make sure, you know, if one of the heartbeats went way up uh, or some kind of distress was detected, they would take her straight to the uh, emergency room and do an emergency C-section. Well, they made it to, I think, 32 weeks or whatever the, basically, the cutoff is, and they were born, and they were placed in the uh, NICU, the NICU, and I can still vividly see them in those, um, what do you call it, incubators, or whatever it is, you know, with all these wires attached to them, these tiny little things, uh, breathing and, and doing well. They were in the NICU for about a month, and... You know, I say all that because today I'm going to talk about paying attention. Paying attention uh, to miracles that happen in everyday life and extraordinary miracles that happen every now and then. Paying attention. Um, Simone Weil, the, the famous French philosopher um, of the resistance against the Nazis, uh, who died of tuberculosis in, I think it was 45, uh, born of malnutrition. Uh, she says that paying attention is prayer. Paying careful attention is prayer. Paying attention to what matters. Being mindful. Being present. Open-hearted. Eyes open. Grounded. Being present. Paying attention is a life of prayer. A life of Prayer. And these miracles are so extraordinary. I see miracles right here in this congregation, you know. When COVID hit, there was about maybe 15 of us. Um, now look at us. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> we have almost doubled in size. And what a beautiful community this is. And a, a beautiful fellowship that we share. And we come together in a common space from so many different perspectives. But we all come together and we share the essence of what it means to be a spiritual community, a horizontal spiritual community as well. I like to think about it. You know, there's vertical too for, for those who want to be embrace that. Uh, but it, it's a spirituality born of a humanistic understanding that human beings are created to be in community with each other, to help each other, and as we do that, we pursue transcendence and meaning. That's a lot to say to uh, introduce the six sources, uh, <laughs> but we're all familiar with the, the seven uh, principles, right? The seven principles of Unitarian Universalism, you know, they're featured prominently in our magazines and our hymnals and all our publications. 
They're clearly defined as a kind of framework for organizing and articulating who we are as a spiritual community. Things like the free and responsible search for truth, um, the interdependent web of all creation and existence, commitments to social justice and helping others. All of these are clearly that laid out in the seven principles. And the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism create a kind of architecture for the fellowship that we embrace. But there's another uh, important uh, stream of ideas for Unitarian Universalism too. Something we're also committed to, but we don't talk about it very much. You don't see it published in very many areas. And it's kind of only mentioned in passing because, well, the seven principles are so prominent, they, they kind of seize the day. But the six sources, as we'll talk about it this morning, are equally important. While the seven principles um, uh, create a kind of spiritual architecture, uh, we live out these seven principles within a living tradition. A living tradition. It's organic. It's not dogmatic. It's not out there. It's not back there. It's right here. It's not dogmatic based on, you know, history or, or the pontifications of church leaders or other spiritual leaders. It's right here. It's right now. It's us. And these six principles create a living tradition of wisdom and spirituality. And they're drawn from sources as diverse as science, poetry, scripture, and our own personal experience. The first source uh, is direct experience. Why is that important? Well, you remember the Reformation, Martin Luther uh, nailed the 95 suggestions on the, the cathedral wall, the bishop's wall, the 95 theses, as he put it, uh, the 95 demands, and, uh, and the, the sense of these demands was that, you know, uh, we don't need this kind of mediation by a, a, a bishop. It's not the priesthood of, of, of folks up there, but it's the priesthood of all believers. We don't need a mediator to connect to the essence of the divine or to the spirit. Each one of us has direct experiential access to that part of transcendence of who we are, that spark of divinity. That's really different and important. It's an important source for us to stand on and embrace. Um, so, we have, so we have seven principles Six sources. Anybody for five golden rings? <laughs> I couldn't help myself. So. <laughs> Direct experience. The, child, the children's version of, of this, the understanding of direct experience, is a sense of wonder and awe that we all share. This is taken from the Unitarian Universalist uh, World magazine. They have the, the uh, sources and what they are, and then at the bottom they have something called the children's version, which I find to be the most helpful. <laughs> the second source is the words and deeds of prophetic men and women, which challenge us to confront the powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. The children's version is that women and men whose lives remind us to be courageously loving are an important source for us in our spiritual living. So to pay attention to courageous women and men who are living out lives of, of loving courageously. The third source is wisdom from the world's religions which inspire us to an ethical and spiritual life. And as Don pointed out this morning, is not exclusive. None other than the Dalai Lama himself says that we need an ethical framework that is outside of religious commitments and dimensions because, well, think about it. How much trouble have we gotten into because of holy wars, mm -hmm. ancient and modern, mm -hmm. you know? If there is an ethical framework attached, somebody's not paying attention. 
So uh, as people of not only a, a religious or a spiritual dimension, we also are people of an ethical dimension. And to embrace that, to be courageously loving. And um, the children's version of the wisdom of the world's religions is ethical and spiritual wisdom. Uh, the fourth source is Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And uh, if God is not your higher power, if you don't acknowledge a higher power, you can still embrace loving your neighbor as yourself. And that does the trick. I mean, speaking as a person of the Christian faith myself, I see how many times I have failed, and I also see the failures of the church in not loving our neighbors as ourselves. If we only did that, the world would be a different place. If we only did that, forget the dogmatic pontifications or anything else. If we only loved our neighbors as ourselves, the world would be a different place. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of all commandments? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is likened to it or equal with it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you've covered the waterfront. Um, okay, so Jewish and Christian teachings call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And that is exactly the same in the children's version. <laughs> the fifth source is humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us, warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. The children's version, the use of reason and the discoveries of science. I want to go back to the, the adult version on this one though because I think it's so rich. Humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. I don't know about you, but are we living in a, a crazy time? I mean, seriously. If someone thinks they can't get a COVID vaccine without getting a chip implanted in them, uh, I mean, I'm not casting aspersions, I'm just saying. What is the source of authority we're paying attention to? Is the demagogues who pontificate trying to lead us astray and build themselves up by making us angry at each other? Or is it the science? I hope it's going to be the science ultimately, but it's a big question mark as to who's won that day. And as if Uncle Sam doesn't already know what you do, you know? Anybody ever do a Google search? <laughs> He's watching it. <laughs> I love that. One of my favorite memes a while back I saw is Alexa. How many of you have Alexa at home? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this family is sitting at the dinner table one night and the dad's telling jokes and they're all having a conversation and they're having a good time. And then the dad wants to share some kind of. Uh, you know, not secret information, but some confidential information. And so he, he lowers his voice to a whisper. And he just talks like this to the family. And he said, Dad, why are you whispering? And he points at Alexa. <laughs> they all laugh. A minute later, Alexa laughs. <laughs> Science. Science can in that case can cut both ways, right? Yeah. Uh, the sixth source are the spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. The children's version of that is the harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life. You know, it's a Lion King, man. You've seen that movie or seen the Broadway show circle of life, it's all connected. It's all connected. It's a beautiful thing. The spiritual teachings of earth-centered uh, traditions is a source of wisdom for us now that we're finally paying attention to. I mean, for so much of the modern experiment, 
born of industrialization and all the machinery we would have put in place to maximize profits or at the expense of the environment, um, you know, we weren't that interested in what someone had to say about making sure the water stayed clean or the air stayed clean. But I was driving down the road the other day, and you know what came to me? I was looking off in the distance, saw these beautiful clouds, and I thought, you know, this is why we have to take care of the environment. Like the wisdom traditions have taught us, we live in a terrarium. How many of you had a terrarium as a kid? I used to be fascinated by terrariums. You put these little plants in, you get just the right amount of water, and you got to get it just right if it's going to sustain itself. And I knew people who had terrariums that had been sealed for like 20 years. I mean, that's incredible. They got it right. We're not getting it right now. And we can learn a lot from Native peoples and from Earth-centered faith traditions that have so much to teach us about the harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life and the interconnectedness of all creation, going back to that principle too. So these six sources inform our spiritual foundations. Maybe think of them as uh, overlapping circles that create a, the contours, a container of sorts that, can, that hold um, in important ways our spiritual heritage and practice. They're similar to the seven principles, but different in important ways. The principles have a specificity while the uh, sources are more general guidelines. The six sources are not talked about so often, but they're incredibly informative to us. And there, I discovered in doing my research on this uh, that there is a cantata written by an award-winning musician who is a Unitarian musician in um, Nashville, a seven-part cantata uh, extolling the virtues of the six sources. And I, you know, I listened to some of it, and it's beautiful stuff. I thought it might not fit with this morning, so I had decided not to put it on the screen, but I'll send out a link uh, through Don, if he's willing, for you to check that. It's really exquisite uh, choral uh, uh, arrangement of, of choir and musical instruments uh, singing about the six sources. Beautiful stuff. As I said, Unitarian Universalist spirituality is intentionally eclectic. The six sources are necessary to help us get a glimpse at the transcendent dimension of life, to get a glimpse of the ineffable, the inexpressible, something the ancient Christian theologians call the apophatic way, the via negativa. You can't say what it is, so you say what it's not, you know. It's, um, we can't describe infinity, uh, so we call something finite, the limited version of it. Um, the six sources give us a glimpse into this spiritual understanding and this deeper spiritual reality. And the six sources, instead of just one source, put together, create the container not an exclusive container, but an idea with permeable exterior walls so that stuff can come and go uh, to help us understand who we are as spiritual people, Unitarian Universalist style. This is why we can sing, in the same service we can sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and at the same time sing a song from, you know, the movie Home Alone, this is a beautiful eclecticism that embraces all perspectives and all uh, diverse um, opinions about things. I remember I, when I lived in LA, I listened to an uh, NPR station called uh, KCRW, and they had a morning program called Morning Becomes Eclectic. How's that for an LA radio show? <laughs> but it was an eclectic sampling of the latest music. Now, some will criticize Unitarianism as being too eclectic, seeing this as a weakness. 
But the honest truth is, and I know you all will agree with me on this, the honest truth is that all faiths are eclectic. Where did the Christmas tree come from? <laughs> it wasn't at the manger, you know. Where did the celebration of Easter come from? Why was that particular time chosen for the celebration of Easter? It's a rite of spring. All these things are eclectic. They're reinterpreted, of course, but they all have eclectic <coughs> origins. We're just more honest about it. And we embrace it and we see it as a strength. One of the great giants of Unitarian Universalism was a theologian and, and church leader in New York City, All Souls New York City. His name is Forrest Church. Have you read any of his stuff or seen any of his stuff? He has a book called um, The Cathedral of the World. And in fact, about two years ago, I did a whole sermon on his ideas in the book Cathedral of the World. Cathedral of the World was written as he was dying of esophageal cancer, stage four. And um, it was written with, uh, with an intensity. He didn't have time to dally. So what he had to say was what he thought, or he felt, was the most important stuff that he can say. And I think he got it right to the heart of things. Um, in the book, he beautifully makes the case that in spiritual experience, what he calls the cathedral of the world, there are many windows, but one light. There are many windows, but one light. And the windows can be different, too. You can have the ornate stained glass cathedral windows of the great cathedrals in the world on the one end. But on the other hand, you can have the beautiful simplicity of a Quaker meeting house and its clear windows. And all belong, and all are equally important. And regardless of their differences, they look out upon the same light. We intentionally acknowledge this as a Unitarian faith. So the winter holidays are upon us. We've gotten a nice sampling this morning. The six sources help us pay attention to what's important. It's easy to see how the words of the prophets, particularly the Old Testament prophets, combined with Jewish and Christian teachings to help us experience this time of year as holy, as sacred, as hallowed, as special. The holidays of Hanukkah and Christmas help us to see the importance of understanding that life is a gift. Life is a gift to be given, to be shared, um, to understand life as an experience of giftedness. We are blessed, and the Hebrew understanding of the reflexive of that word, the verb to be blessed, the reflexive of that is what's used in the biblical text, which means this, we are blessed so that we may be blessings to others. It's a beautiful understanding. It's a receiving, but it's also a giving forth. Our commitment to the humanist teachings of Unitarian Universalism prick our consciences so that uh, we understand that just as a life is a gift, it's a gift to be shared, and that our commitment to those who are without enough food, those who are without homes, those who are struggling with medical issues, uh, those who are struggling with social justice issues from all over the spectrum, from Black Lives Matter to uh, gay and trans rights to uh, poverty to homelessness. All of these, including care of the environment, are social justice concerns that we are pricked to consider because of the source of Unitarian Universalism's commitment to social justice teachings. And our source of earth-centered religions helps us see uh, the precious connection we live in as an environment and helps us not take that for granted. One way we do this this time of year is to celebrate the winter solstice. And what a glorious day that is. And, and if we pay attention to that, if we are mindfully attentive and present to that, we are praying with our hearts to embrace the cosmic connectedness that we share with, with this incredible, vast, 
universe, or some might say universes. You know, it's Carl Sagan saying, yes, we're dust, but we are stardust. We are formed out of the dust of stars that have supernova. That's something to take to heart. The six sources inspire us to pay attention to what's important, to pay attention. Simone Weil, remember, to pay attention is to pray. Gratitude is the foundation, I believe, of all the six sources. So I'd like for us to pay attention, to pray about what's important in each other's eclectic, diverse holiday traditions today. How do you experience the winter holidays? What's important to you? What makes time at this part, point in the year so special? If you have traditions you observe that you'd be willing to share. And I'm going to invite you to do that in just a minute. I'm going to tell you a little bit about mine. This time of year, I love to go out into the dark night, with the cold dark night, and see the stars when the skies are clear, uh, especially around the winter uh, solstice, just to be reminded of how connected we are to all the rest of, of creation, and to be humbled by it, to be awe-inspired by it, to be filled with wonder looking at it. When I look at the I have a telescope, and when I put it out and I look at the moons of Jupiter that I can see, I can see four moons of Jupiter with my telescope. Mm -hmm. And it makes my heart dance. Mm -hmm. It changes me to see things like, I can see the Saturn's rings. Mm -hmm. We took the telescope down to Charleston one time and showed the moon to the grandchildren, and one of the granddaughters, she jumped off it the stool that we had set up so that they could get up to the eyepiece, and she started screaming, I see footprints! <laughs> I was going to say, I knew this telescope was awesome, but I didn't know it was that strong. <laughs> and I love to see family and friends near and far. This year we're going to spend time with my family and, and our mother's home in Gaffney. It'll be the first time we've been back together in that home for a long time, probably since she was alive and she died 15 years ago. We're going to get back together and be in that space and honor her life and each other's lives by remembering and paying attention to one another and hearing the stories that we'll share. I also like um, the way Maria inspires us to decorate for the holidays. You should see this woman decorating, man. It's a sight to behold. I can put an icicle on the tree and she's got the rest of the house decorated. And that's a good, that, that's a really good uh, uh, sharing on my part. <laughs> she does it better than I do. I have Christmas, a little Charlie Brown Christmas tree. You, know? you, can, get them at, you can get them at Walmart. You can push a little button that plays that great tune by Vince Guaraldi, you know, Linus and Lucy. I also love to listen to a festival of lessons and carols from King's College in Cambridge. They uh, broadcast that every Christmas morning. Um, and it's just so beautiful. It keeps me in touch with that sort of ancient tradition of choral music, which I love uh, even more than hip hop, you know, and other contemporary forms of music. Uh, it's just soul inspiring to hear those, those choristers sing this transcendent, beautiful, ancient, music. Um, so our sources create a container for us to pay attention, to pray attention, to be attentive to each other, to be mindful of maybe which source inspires us more than the others, and to be in dialogue as a community and talking about that and sharing with one another. Who has a, who has a tradition you're willing to share? <laughs> Derek's got one. time and reminding ourselves of what's important. Yeah, what were you going to say? In past, we did this in past years. I don't know if we'll do it this year because we've just moved down to Columbus. 
but every year we did a, a solstice hike in DuPont Forest with a group of environmental environmental groups hosted it and you would hike in the dark to Hooker Falls and then when you got to Hooker Falls you got your cocoa or whatever beverage you brought wow. toasted celebration of coming of light and and the beauty of solstice. Oh that gives me chills. What a great thing to do. I hope you'll do it. Yeah we can do it. Serving Carolina is hosting one of those. Oh serving Carolina is hosting one of those. Really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right here? Yeah, or oh, Hooker Falls. No, nice. Hooker Falls, the same place, yeah. Okay, good to know. To be out in creation, to be out in the environment. Please get the microphone. It's really important. Okay, yeah. Nick, what were you going to say? I have a tradition that my wife started, and if you know of my wife well, you know Christmas is probably the biggest part of her life. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I have a workshop, and she, when we first moved to this house, she decorated my workshop. <laughs> the workshop has a Charlie Brown tree, which doesn't Oh, exist. excellent. Every window has lights in it. And a specific part of all of it is every single ornament, which is probably up to 50 or 60 now, represents something of me. Whatever it might be. Wow. She's really, paying really, attention. It's really cool. So that, that started seven years ago. That's a nice Oh, that's beautiful. Love that. Well, and Kathy is quite the consummate Christian, uh, uh, Christmas aficionado and uh, celebrant. Love the way you decorate. Second to none. Yeah. I saw another hand over here. Yeah, Robin. Dave and I, after Thanksgiving, this is are done, we pull out the bridge table and pull out a jigsaw puzzle that we work on until Christmas. Oh, and it's, okay. it's very meditative and we do it together and it's it's not really spiritual, but in a sense it's something to look forward to, which is nice yeah. to have. That's a beautiful tradition. You have to slow down mm -hmm. and be present mm -hmm. and you do it together. What a beautiful spiritual practice, you know? And, and you're doing something creative. You're building something. Love that. Yeah, Barb. I've shared, this, I've shared this before, so if you have heard it, just bear with me. When my son was four and my daughter was just about 18 months, we moved. We moved. And... First Christmas, we went looking for things to do and, and to get presents and so on and so forth. We wound up in a nursery with plants and, and all the stuff that goes around with all of that. And my son and my daughter, with my husband's help, selected a gift for me for Christmas. It was uh, a little uh, wrought iron candlestick holder with orange glaze on it. And a candle, a pillar candle about six or eight inches tall, again in shades of orange. <laughs> I thought, okay. So when we got home and Got it. I didn't see it, supposedly, but I got it for Christmas, so we took it out, put it up, set it up on the candle on the little candle stand, and we lit it. We've done that every year that the kids were home. We used that same candle. That's what, that's what it's for. It's Christmas candle, uh -huh. even though it's orange. <laughs> And, and, Christmas and we light that and s meditate a little bit and sing Christmas songs or play music, Christmas music. Well, the kids are gone. They're in their own homes and doing things. I still have what's left of that candle, and that was 50 years ago. Wow. wow. And I still got about three inches of it. Oh, wow. wow. So every year I pull out my candle and my candle holder and I 
light the candle on Christmas Eve. Oh my God! And we all remember it, yeah. but we don't. We're not together on it, but we are together on we're it. We're together, yeah. So that's our Christmas tradition. Oh, what a beautiful story! Thank you for sharing that. And when you light that candle, you reconnect yes. with them in a powerful way. Yes. Um, my two boys um, are big into uh, the government. Sorry. My two boys uh, were always into sort of rock climbing, and when they were little, they would do the walls. And then they graduated to all uh, ropes and clips and wow. doing like El Capitan and wow. big stuff. Oh, man. But it all started um, with the Three Kings. We had our crush on the huh. little table, and they'd put the three kings in the kitty corner of the room, and every day they'd take oh, turns yeah. moving them towards the table. <laughs> <laughs> and then the real wonder of it all was my eldest said, well, now what? We've got to get them up to the top of this little table where the manger is and everything. So they rigged up ropes. Oh my gosh. And so the three kings were like in in um, a little line going up the ropes, and then they, they finally made it. But we did that every year, and um, I just love thinking about that. It makes That's me giggle. so incredible, and how that inspired them to be climbers. Wow. Love that! Wow, that's amazing. We had, a, we had a crush uh, when my daughter was a baby and, you know, and we'd hold off on putting the baby Jesus in the manger until, you know, what, Christmas Day, right? They hadn't been born yet. Uh, or Christmas Eve at the latest. And one year we lost the baby Jesus. <laughs> it's going to be a Christmas without Jesus, you know. And we looked everywhere, couldn't find anywhere. And then uh, one night some folks were over <coughs> And uh, Margaret comes running, screaming through the house, I found Jesus! I found <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> We're still looking up and down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those crashes are precious. I love that. Thank you. What else? Yeah, Beth. Well... Uh, I was born and raised in New York, and in the, uh, in the wonderful tradition of all New York people who were raised Jewish, um, I ate Chinese food a lot. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> I love that. What a great tradition. <laughs> well, maybe Jesus would too, because he was Jewish. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, so, you know, I wanted to kind of talk about the sources, creating a, an experiential sort of community and have an opportunity for us to, to share in that by sharing our stories, you know. Uh, these, these traditions, these rituals are ways that we pay attention to what's important to us. The, um, the sources are a means by which we can do that, you know. They offer us a fantastic spiritual vocabulary to, to describe our experiences. And uh, so, good. Thank you. Right. Um, and now we're going to have... Uh, yes, Ellen. I would, I would just like to... I, I hate to throw something dark into the light here, but... Yeah. Christmas is also a very difficult time for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Because they don't yeah. have their families and they don't yeah. and they I know for me it's difficult yeah. because I everybody that I used to celebrate with is either too far away or no longer with us. And, yeah. And so I kind of like to pretend it isn't even there, you know, it isn't yeah. even happening. I get and that. I'm sure there are other people who feel that way of too. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not by accident that Christmas Day is the high, I think it's the highest suicide rate of the year is Christmas Day. Because nothing could live up to the hype right. that we have, you know? Right. Nothing could live up to that hype that we set out for ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Ellen. 
And it's really, really important to hear and to be reminded of folks whose family is far away or no longer with us, you know. That is the time of heartbreak as well as joy. And, and it all kind of belongs, but it's the darker parts are tough, tough to deal with, you know. So we light a candle uh, in memory of those you have shared Christmas with in the past and, and as we anticipate who you'll share Christmas with in the future. And Nick is so kind to help us out with that. I love that. So remember this candle is burning for you. Thank you, Nick. Anyone else? Well, you know, um, one of the traditions of, of Jesus, the Christmas story and all that, is he came to be the Prince of Peace, uh, to work for peace in the world. And uh, we have specially uh, booked for this occasion our very own house band, Blue Wall. <laughs> They're going to lead us in the song now to, to uh, sing about that. Spiritual, written around the time of the Civil War. And of course, it has become an anti war song. I'm really glad Linda said what he just said about the Prince of Peace. I've been sitting there wondering how we're going to merge this song with, uh, <laughs> with all the comments about traditions and Christmas. It doesn't seem to fit. But he did say that this is an eclectic group. So but I keep that in mind. <laughs> in the book of Isaiah, there's some line about um, ain't going to study war anymore. Or it doesn't say ain't, but it says we won't study. And it says nations shall not um, put swords to other nations. So we have a ways to go on that. Yeah. But, um, so, we want you to sing. We want you to clap when you feel it. Dance. Um, Dance. We'll do the four, four, uh, Hopefully you can see up there, he's got a nice and big. Uh, we'll do four measures with the chorus in between each of them, and we'll do the chorus twice at the end. Are you ready?
swords into plowshares. That means we're going to take our weapons of destruction and turn them into something of construction. And take a negative and make it positive. I mean, that's the heart of the, Christian message, of the Christmas message. That's the heart of who we are as Unitarians, is to take what is and make it better. Okay. Um, and now as we... Um, Extinguish the flame, Nick, if you'd be so kind, let us say together, We extinguish the flame of this chalice. Let us follow the light of truth until we meet again. <laughs> 